Yup, they're dead. After three and a half days of wild-eyed speculation and some of the stupidest expert analysis we have ever heard anywhere on anything, they found the debris field from the missing submarine today, and by all appearances, shazam, shazam! It looks like the vehicle suffered a catastrophic loss of hull integrity and thus imploded, instantly killing the five people on board. Moral of the story? Well, there's two morals to the story, really. The first moral is Occam's razor always wins. When you're trying to explain an an unexplained phenomenon and there's a screamingly obvious answer that comports with all of the known facts, that obvious answer is going to be correct well over 99% of the time. And the second moral is, despite 85 years of technological advances, despite the existence of real-time, global, worldwide communication, the news business is in no better shape today than it was on the day Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan went missing in July of 1937. In fact, it might be in demonstrably worse shape. But don't try telling that to the fake news performance artist community. What? Everybody else gets to be a community, so why the hell not them? They are united by their common inability to distinguish their asses from a hole in the ground. And look, I'm not even saying that the wild-eyed speculation and idiotic expert analysis was totally improper. But the way they did it was very much totally improper. They wanted a race against the clock, so they invented one. They wanted to make an exciting entertainment product, so they did. But nothing about this was news. Be under no illusions about that. Could they have accomplished the thing they wanted to and still abide by the basic rules of journalism? Sure they could have. For starters, bring on expert interview subjects who have actual expertise on the thing you're talking about. And when you bring them on, you have to open with Occam's razor. You have to lay out the fact in plain English that there is an overwhelming likelihood the vessel imploded and the people were killed instantly. And it happened on Sunday when they first lost voice communication and the locator beacon at the same time. And once you've laid out the actual facts and what the likely outcome is, then sure, go ahead and get into some hypotheticals and some speculation. But you have to preface it by saying, We're going to get into some hypotheticals and speculation now, because that is what journalists do. When the story you're investigating has an explanation and an outcome that is orders of magnitude more likely than all other potential explanations combined, you tell the audience that before you start spinning yarn out your ass, because you're not supposed to be in the business of creating an exciting narrative. You're not supposed to be in the business of dicks for clicks. You're supposed to be in the business of providing to the public an accurate and dispassionate accounting of the events of the day. And if you do that job well, that's supposed to be how you get good ratings. If there's anything about this outcome that I didn't expect, it's that they actually located the vessel at all. I thought even that was pretty unlikely, since Titanic herself is a thousand feet long and it took 75 years to find her. But it turns out the doomed submersible, the Ocean Gate Titan, wound up coming to rest only about a thousand yards off Titanic's bow. For my money, this is one of the worst weeks in the history of the news business. Granted, they they haven't actually been covering themselves in glory since the start of this century and the advent of the internet, but what we saw this week, I think it was uniquely disgusting. And I think I'm not done talking about it just yet. Jim Eagle, hit my special birthday music. You're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older, and now you're older still. From high atop the battlements of Castle Kermotion, where the host is glad to be turning 39 for the 11th time, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all ships at sea, welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. As I record this, it's only been about 9 or 10 hours since the confirmation went out that the Ocean Gate Titan is indeed wrecked, and the occupants are indeed deceased, but already I've seen a pretty wide range of public reaction, and there seems to be a lot of scorn getting directed at the whole concept of rich guys engaging in highly dangerous, hugely expensive acts of daredevil tourism. But I don't really understand it, frankly. It's not like rich guy daredevil tourism is any sort of recent development. Rich guys flaunt their wealth in a variety of ways, as they have always done. 
If you're Donald Trump, to name one example, you flaunt your wealth by building skyscrapers and putting your name on them in big, huge block letters and flying around in a private 737 with your name on it in big, huge block letters. Other rich guys flaunt their wealth by banging lots of hot young women, which could also apply to Donald Trump, if we're being honest, or buying lots of fancy cars or sports teams or private Caribbean islands or whatever. But there's another breed of rich guy who doesn't have any interest in those same sorts of ostentatious displays of affluence. Those guys like to flaunt their wealth by risking life and limb to visit the most inaccessible spots on the planet, or, or even more recently, in outer space. They have a deep and abiding desire to do things and to go places that ordinary people could never dream of doing and going because ordinary people cannot afford such things. It costs $250,000 for one ticket to the Titanic wreck site, which is eight times more than the gross income the average American makes in a calendar year. And to a certain breed of rich guy, that fact alone makes doing the thing an attractive proposition. Rich guys have been trying to scale Mount Everest, Everest ever since the day Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay proved it could actually be done. Go to the summit of Everest today, and you'll wind up in a traffic jam of six or seven hundred other rich guys all waiting for their turn for their 90 seconds on top of the mountain because that's about all you get. And several times per decade, at least, some rich guy or group of rich guys perish in that attempt and their frozen corpses still litter the mountainside because that's the other thing that a certain breed of rich guy needs in order to feel alive, mortal danger. I want to go to a place nobody else can afford to go to, and I want there to be a not insignificant chance that I might die in the process. And I don't think the psychology is very difficult to figure out. It's the same story you'll hear from every, every drugged up rock star who emerges from a 90 day stint in the rehab clinic. I could buy anything I wanted. I had hot and cold running women 24 hours a day. I was putting $3,000 a day up my fucking nose, and none of it made me feel happy or fulfilled. So that's how I wound up wrapping my Lamborghini around that telephone pole, getting blind drunk and driving down PCH at 135 miles per hour was the only thing I could do that made me feel alive and excited. Why? Because I was doing a thing that might kill me. Rich guy daredevil tourism is just a slightly more urbane version of the drunk rock star wrapping his fancy car around a telephone pole. The rich guy does it because, and they never tell you this beforehand, but being rich tends to be rather stultifyingly boring. When money is no object, when you can buy anything and anyone you want at any time, excitement is much more difficult to come by. So you wind up doing some pretty outlandish things like diving 13,000 feet down to the ocean floor in a tiny submarine, knowing the whole time for the whole 10 or 11 hours that if there's even a tiny failure of that vessel's hull integrity, you are going to be dead before your next eye blink. So I don't really understand the desire to criticize rich guys who do this sort of stuff. They are fully aware of the risks. They're not endangering anybody but themselves, so who gives a shit? I've heard a shocking number of people say just in these last nine hours or so that, damn it, they need to ban anybody else from diving to the Titanic wreck site. First of all, who the hell is they? These are international waters. No government has jurisdiction there. Anybody can dive whenever the hell they feel like it. The Titanic wreck site itself and its contents are protected by UN convention and by acts of the US Congress and the British Parliament, but nobody can tell you not to go there. The rules are basically the same as the rules in a museum. You can visit, you can look around, just don't touch anything or take anything. And I've heard other people say, and this one's even more hilarious, I bet this is the end of Titanic tourism. What, just because some people died one time, that's going to eliminate the market for rich guy daredevil tourism? Um, no. Far from it. There will be just as many rich guys lining up to buy tickets at the start of next year as there were at the start of this year. Mark it down, that is a guarantee. This incident will have not even the slightest chilling effect on the titanic rich guy tourism market. If anything, we might see increased demand rather than diminished demand. Because the danger is all the more palpable now that people have died. And danger is exactly what these guys are looking for. If there's anything about this story that's improbable, 
It's that it took almost 40 years of people diving to that wreck site before there was an accident and somebody got killed. That's really kind of a huge upset. But this is also a powerful reminder that hazardous forms of travel are never routine. At the start of 1986, everybody thought space shuttle missions were routine. We've flown this thing 24 times already, nothing bad's ever happened. It's like a walk in the park, right? Hell, it's so safe, let's start taking civilians along. 18 years and two destroyed shuttles and 14 dead astronauts later, we had figured out, yeah, maybe it wasn't so routine after all. And the safety margins for a deep-sea submersible at 13,000 feet are even narrower than they are for a spacecraft up in orbit. If your spacecraft springs a tiny leak, there's at least a reasonable chance of being able to plug it. If your deep-sea submersible springs that same link, leak, you are dead before you have the chance to say, oh shit! And speaking of things that make you say, oh shit, we forgot to do the Pride Month update last episode, Jim Eagle. And I blame you entirely, by the way. But there's big breaking news today from the Pride Month update desk. After over two months of complete dumbfounded silence, Bud Light's Twitter account actually posted something today. Wait, what's that? They deleted the tweet already? Jesus. Because it got ratioed into oblivion? Well, it couldn't happen to a nicer company. Well done, Transheiser Bush. Well done indeed. Like I said last week, Bud Light is a thoroughly ruined brand. There is no coming back from a self-inflicted PR disaster like this one. It's just not going to happen, Transheiser Bush. All the Bud Clydesdales and all the Bud men will never put Humpty Dumpty in a dress back together again. But it didn't have to be that way. They could have salvaged their brand's credibility by taking the, the right series of steps right when the disaster was first blowing up. I'm not even talking about an outright apology and a disavowal of transgenderism. They, they didn't need to do any of that. All they needed to do was poke a bit of fun at themselves. If I was running the, the marketing department at Transheiser Bush, and you gave me carte blanche and a blank check to do whatever the hell I felt necessary to salvage the brand, you know what I would have done? I would have made another Dylan Mulvaney commercial. I would have brought in Dylan Mulvaney, given him a haircut, wiped the dumb makeup off his face, dressed him up in a cowboy outfit, stuck him on top of a horse, and told him to extol the virtues of American masculinity. Then I would dress him up in an army uniform, hand him an M16, and have him storm Omaha Beach alongside a CGI John Wayne. Then I would dress him up as Uncle Sam and have him wave a big goddamn American flag while reading out the preamble to the Constitution. Problem solved. All it would have taken was a bit of self-deprecating humor. You make that commercial, and you don't need to issue any mealy-mouthed apologies. The apology is implicit in the humor. But what the hell do I know anyway? I don't have a fancy master's degree in marketing hanging on my wall like Alyssa Heinerscheid does on hers. So she clearly knows more about this stuff than I ever could. And if your first reaction to that is to say, but wait, Dylan Mulvaney would never agree to participate in something like that. My response is this. Are you freaking kidding me? The guy who decided to pursue a career as a woman face internet minstrel to avoid having to get a real job? The guy who will do literally anything as long as it gets him paid because he was born without the capacity for either shame or self-respect? You think that guy would refuse to do something if there was a paycheck in it for him? Hell, add as many zeros to the number as you need to, and the amount is still going to be one hell of a lot less than the $27 billion the idiots at Transheiser Bush have managed to piss away in the last less than 80 days. If you need to pay Dylan Mulvaney two million bucks to come in and play male dress-up for one day, hell, if you need to pay him 20 million bucks, it's a freaking no-brainer. You have to do it. Or they could go the route they have actually chosen, which is a combination of fear-induced paralysis, a 100% social media blackout, and an occasional milk-toast platitude-filled half-assed press release from the CEO. We just want people to come together over a beer! Can't we all get along? I believe in the marketing business they call that the Rodney King Gambit. Oh, and we have another Pride Month update. Regarding the anti-Catholic hate group, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, the L.A. Dodgers followed through on their threat to give these perverts a Community Hero Award. 
which they did last Tuesday, and they were careful to do the little ceremony a full hour before first pitch so, so there would be as few people in the stands as possible. And the way that story was covered by conservative media was, it has to be said, a bunch of fake news horseshit. They all tried to play the angle of, look, the ballpark was nearly empty when they handed out the award because the fans all stayed away in protest. Um, guys... How about you stop lying? Because that's just a flat-out falsehood. They did the ceremony at 6 o'clock before a 7 o'clock game precisely because there would not be anybody in the stands. I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Dodger game before, but the home crowd tends to arrive around the bottom of the second, and they leave at the seventh inning stretch. That's just the way baseball works in Los Angeles. It's been that way for over 60 years. There was nobody in the stands at 6 o'clock because there's never anybody in the stands at 6 o'clock. Yes, there were a lot of protesters out in the parking lot, and that's a very encouraging sign, but come on, man. Why resort to such obvious dishonesty? 54,000 people showed up for the game. If anybody stayed away over the thing with the anti-Catholic hate group, their numbers were not statistically significant. Is that disappointing? Sure it is. But there's no reason to call things what they are not. I also think it's so very precious, the rhetorical strategy that the wokesters have adopted in order to defend the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. The argument goes like this. It is perfectly fitting and appropriate to honor and celebrate this group and to give them a free pass on the anti-Catholic hate speech that is their whole raison d'etre because they help the homeless and contribute to charity. Oh, is that what we're going with? Are you guys absolutely positive that's the argument you want to hang your hat on? Because I feel like if I stated the obvious rejoinder, you might find yourselves painted into a corner that you don't very much want to be in, because if the argument is that we should ignore all hate speech from groups that give to charity, does that mean all the Ku, -Ku, Ku Klux Klan has to do is open a soup kitchen for homeless vagrants and you won't give them a hard time about the whole white supremacy thing anymore? Look, I know the trans activist movement isn't exactly teeming with lots of intellectual heavyweights, but even still, before you put an argument out there for public consumption, don't you at least take a moment or two to think, how might our opponents respond to this thing we are about to say? But apparently they don't, which I suppose is a byproduct of, of becoming accustomed to living in a world where the whole political establishment and the whole news media establishment are always working overtime to insulate you and your crazy indefensible views from anything resembling reasonable scrutiny. Shut up, transphobe! You, you filthy, bigoted hate monger! Thank you very much indeed for watching. Please feel free to leave your birthday wishes in the comments. And ladies, in case you're wondering, I do accept birthday pictures as long as they are in impeccably good taste. Have a great day and a pleasant tomorrow. I will see you next week. Until then, do not comply. Get off my lawn!